We are now recording. All right. And so this um, is going to be a, a, a listen to the moderator. researcher. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> I will go ahead and introduce you guys since All I right. thought Alan was going to moderate, but evidently he isn't. So I'll do it. <laughs> So I'm going to introduce our speakers today for the open source help that factors. Um, we have Josh Wilson from Longsight, uh, David Wiedemann, who's our uh, researcher, uh, Martin Ramsey from the LAMP Consortium, and Jennifer Burns. And I'm sorry I don't have your bios in front of me, so um, if you'd like to add more to your interest, please do, but um, I'll leave it to you to take it away. Thank you very much, and I am going to share my screen. And if I learned from Josh anything yesterday, you will now see the presentation. Yay. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, hi, everybody. Morning. I'm Dave. And I think what Jennifer and I'll do is we'll just drop, we can drop a link to our, like our web page bios in the chat at some point if you want, and then save ourselves some time from talking through our life's history, if that's okay. Um, Jennifer and I are going to talk today, but uh, Josh and Martin, our key members of the team, wouldn't be a project without them. And they're here and they'll be putting things in the chat while we speak. So I have this idea that I'll say some things and then it might be corrected shortly thereafter. <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, that's actually good pedagogy. So um, before we start, I wanted to just thank, thank you, Wilma, for uh, jumping in and, and moderating, kicking things off. And then I want a big, big thank you to the Sakai community because they've sponsored our project and been the subject of our project. So we've been poking and prodding them for months um, and they've been very kind and, and haven't seemed too frustrated about it. So big thank you to them. So uh, let's see, now I'm going to advance the slide. So here's our agenda. Um, Jen's going to come on and give the overview of the Open Source Health Factors project at a high level. Uh, she'll hand it back off to me and I'll give the update from our phase one, the outcomes from phase one, and then the, the uh, preliminary findings from phase two, which we're still in. Then I'll hand it back to Jen, who will talk a little bit about our assessment philosophy. So that's an upcoming phase, and then we'll open it up for a Q and A. And in all our practices, there was substantial time left over for Q and A. So hopefully, we will be able to to keep that here too. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Jen and let her talk about the Open Source Health Factors project. Jennifer, are you there? My mistake. Mike was <laughs> off. <laughs> Apologies for that. I'm just talking away, wondering what's okay. Uh, okay. Thank <laughs> I you, everyone. Good afternoon. Embarrassing and then relax. So there we go. <laughs> just did it. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Burns, um, and I wanted to thank David and Wilma for setting up um, setting up the introduction to this. Um, for the next few slides, I'd like to explore the progress with the project of the open source health factors. Um, for this project, our guiding questions are, how do we know if an open source project is healthy and how can we assess that project's health? Um, if you could move forward to the next slide, please, David. Thank you. So the timeline for the, this project began in October of 2019. And during phase one, we explored the relevant re literature and expanded our search into organizational development and design. And then in the beginning of 2020, we were invited to observe and interview the Sakai Blue Sky Group. Um, during this process, we refined our health factors. And currently we're in the process of developing an assessment tool. And in phase four, we will test the validity of our assessment tool in the Sakai community. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So I'll jump back on and talk about um, what came out of phase one. So phase one, as Jennifer said, we reviewed a bunch of literature. Here it is. You're not expected to read all this. Uh, you can see that you'll have access to the presentation later and there's a bibliography at the end if you're interested in these things. But we, we looked at everything we thought might be relevant to uh, health factors and organizations. And we came up with what we thought were eight uh, potentially relevant factors. And we categorize those factors in clumps that we call factor categories. 
And uh, instead of going over each of the factors individually, which would require us sometimes to explain the whole uh, field of research, what I thought I'd do is try to give you the essence, what I'm calling the essence of each of the factor categories. Um, and here's my attempt at doing that. So the, the people factors um, basically are looking at this. Um, well, the assumption is that a healthy or open source community would be priorita prioritizing learning, growth, relatedness, and inclusion. Um, building a culture that puts people first. Uh, the task factors um, focus on tasks. So the idea is that a healthy open source community or project would have efficient task processes, be able to handle tasks well, and be measuring things. And, and finally, organizational design. We, we assume that a healthy organizational community and project would be thinking about its organizational design structure and governance and have systems in place that made sense based on the work that they were doing. Um, so that's the, that's my quick sum of phase one. I'll drop into phase two. So that was the ideas that we thought after we looked at the, the research, but that was just us looking at research. That wasn't us looking at any actual human beings doing anything. So phase two is about us engaging with people that actually do open source work to find out if we were on track or not. So Sakai volunteered to let us study them. So in phase two, uh, that's what we've been doing. Uh, and the, the phase has been a little bit uh, delayed by the pandemic. So it's a little bit longer than we intended, but it's wrapping up. And so we, I can give you some preliminary sense of what we're finding um, now. And this is the components of phase two. So phase two had uh, basically three ways to engage with the community. We have survey, which is still live and anyone can participate in, in it. Uh, and we did, we conducted interviews and we observed Sakai working groups in action. So I'm just gonna kind of report out on these. So the survey uh, had a really simple design. It had two questions. We asked people, what do you think are the factors that make uh, open source communities healthy or not healthy? Uh, so those are the two questions. And we didn't tell them, we specifically did not tell them what our factors we had come up with. We didn't hide it so they could see it on our project website, but we just asked them what they thought. So the things they told us were spontaneously generated from their experience. So we thought that was a good way to check our assumptions about what would make things healthy. So you can see the top major themes coming from the survey question related to what makes a healthy uh, open source project here. Uh, community involvement, emphasis of user experience, excuse me, involvement of supportive organizations. Um, and here I am, we're, we're starting to look at the major themes in the surveys and trying to figure out, do these align with the factor categories? And so I put these little flags <laughs> to represent the, the, like that first one, community involvement. That sounds like a people factor, right? So that sounds like maybe we're on track with the people factor category. And some seem to be a little bit of both. Um, relatedness, camaraderie, a feeling of togetherness, that feels like people, but collaboration moves into the task factors, right? Like it's an effective task if you can collaborate well on it, right? So um, so there you go. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you the, uh, the summary of the main themes in the unhealthy factors when we're just picking the top. Uh, we're seeing the absence or fracturing of community. A community is breaking into kind of squabbles. We're seeing uh, absence of communication or coordination, absence of relatedness. Um, one of the major themes that popped to the top was this too much reliance on or unilateral work by one contra uh, contributor or one institutional contributor. And so as we start to align those two, um, the, the uh, factor categories we came up with, we're starting to see like, they all seem to relate to the people piece. Some seem to relate to task, one seems to relate to the organizational category. Uh, let me give you the high level combined uh, take on um, both interviews and observations. I just combined the, the data set for the purposes of doing this preliminary thing. And, and I looked at what are the top three effective characteristics of uh, open source communities that we're seeing in observations or people are telling us about in interviews and what are the top three ineffective uh, factors. So top three effective things that we're seeing or we're definitely seeing in our observations in Sakai, like just unusually 
healthy interpersonal stuff, right? So the, the relatedness piece seems we see it happening, right? We see people taking care of each other and putting themselves first. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, we see effective task processes. You know, just the example that comes to mind is that really neat, I think it's called Sakai now project management team uses this really neat um, tool that's both agenda and notes taking document and um, and like linked, it's like connects all the links to the all the different windows you need to keep open. It's this process, this multifunctional processing tool that everybody seems to use really effectively and efficiently. That and it's a log, it's a meeting log of past meetings. So that seemed to me to be like a hyper effective task process designed for the specific context. And we're also seeing um, involvement of institutional members, which comes under the organizational category. That we we propose we supposed at the beginning that organizational institutions would play a key role in open source communities, but we're also seeing things that are like you know signs of less effective things being mentioned or coming up. So we have seen and heard people talk about like the in, the inability to really discuss difficult problems, and that's not unusual to open source. That's a problem everywhere. Um, but we're seeing that we, we, we heard uh, and felt a little bit in our observations that it sometimes it's hard for new people to the community to get in and to figure out where to stick and connect and how to add their piece to it and what form to put their piece in. Um, and we also heard that uh, if you had an idea or a direction to take uh, or to propose, uh, it wasn't always sure, they weren't always, people weren't always sure, where, how, do, how do I propose this or who do I say it to or who's the decider? So those are the kinds of things, themes that we're seeing. And um, so I'm flagging them. I think I have an extra P there, but I'm flagging these. <laughs> these flags became misaligned, but I'm flagging them. So you can see that some of them are coming under the P, some are tasks, some are the organizational here as well. And, um, okay, so one of the interesting things is that after we did a round of surveys and interviews and observations, we started to see more factors that we might need to add or sub factors into factor categories. So I'll just show you some of those. So um, into the people factor, after we observed and talked to people, we thought, oh, psychological safety might be important. That's the characteristic of a group that can talk about difficult things. That's what psychological safety is. You can talk about the hard stuff. Um, there might be, you need to be an onboard thinking theory or process, um, excuse me, moving forwards, advancing the slide to when I can. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with, ah, there we go. I'm advancing the slide. Uh, for the task factors, we thought there might be some kind of a, a need a task around direction setting or strategic planning or strategic engagement, or here's where you put ideas that, for things we need to do next. Um, and finally, we thought there's a big role of governance. We hadn't considered this before, but we thought, uh, you know, transparent governance so that the people in the teams know what the team's functions are and their roles are and what their role in the team is um, seems important. And with that, I'm going to uh, give it back to Jennifer, who's going to talk a little bit about our assessment philosophy. Whoops. Thanks. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> which one do you go into next? I don't know. What do you want? You want this one? Which one? This one. No. This one. Sorry. The circle works. I'm Thank having you. a hard time over here. The <laughs> buttons. I apologize. No worries. Um. So, what you the circle? What what this circle represents in front of you um, is our process for ongoing informative assessment. Um, it's going to include gathering data, making improvements, and evaluating those improvements. It's important with any project that we continuously, um, it be data driven. Um, changes that are made within the project, what's, work, what's working, what isn't working, and that's all driven by the data. Um, and how will we assess this data? Um, what we're in the process of developing is a tool that will hopefully be available online for open community groups to go in and assess the health of their own organization. Um, David, if you wanted to move forward to a little, the next slide. So this is just a, a sample. This is not um, something that is obviously, we can see it's health assessment questionnaire. This is more for the medical field. Um, but something like this would like to be able to develop to be able to, um, to measure the health of the open source 
community and to have the, the tool available to all communities online so that you know maybe down the road that we're collecting longitudinal data we can see okay this worked in 2020 but it's not going to work in 2025 um, and just to be able to continually evolve this project um, holistically as the um, as the life cycle of the projects so we're uh, i think we've achieved our uh, planned speaking portion of this presentation and now we're ready just to uh, take questions and uh, if we can figure out how to get the link in the chat you can give us feedback or join you if you actually even take the survey yourself through these links um, and uh, why don't I just open the floor up and uh, I can stop my share and that way I can participate in the chat too uh, questions uh, Josh and Martin maybe we ask you how did, what was going on in the chat while we talked and is there any questions come up or are there things that we didn't address that we ought to clarify or speak to well I don't think we were uh, correcting anything which was your big concern <laughs> no I was an invi invitation not a concern it was a, I was happy <laughs> but just we were just sort of uh, adding adding little little tidbits here and there I'm yeah. curious to know what people think about the particularly the, the main factors, I guess, you know, do, do they feel on or do they feel off? And that's the essence of phase two right there, Martin, you just, that's what we're trying to find out. Do people think people's assumptions about what makes these communities healthy, do they align with ours? Yeah. Uh, Jacques Reno, can I jump in? Please. Uh, Nice presentation. Thank you very, very much. Have you, have you checked a little bit the, the impact of the size of the community? Because I think the size is something that is quite important. Uh, you won't have a, an open source community of a good size, but when the size is too much, too, too big, there might be some issues about uh, maybe people say, well, the you know, groups building and you know that kind of stuff but I, I thought science is uh, I'm asking that because Karuta is a small open source community uh, and of course for us the challenge is more like to get more people and to sort of uh, uh, you know just a, 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 an idea about uh, the impact of uh, size on, on your work. Uh, I can speak to that quickly and then other people can add their two cents. Uh, I had two thoughts the first is Size is one of the things that we have kind of filed provisionally under the category of uh, quantitative metrics, <laughs> things that can be counted. Um, and we're assuming that the assessment will have a place for these. And that at some point, we're going to need to develop, as you mentioned, some ideas about where what's a good, what's the healthy range for these measurable uh, uh, metrics. And then the, the, the challenge of that is it's gonna be a contextually determined range. For some communities, more is gonna work better or different times in their life cycle. So we had thought about it, but we hadn't taken a stance on what size would be good. And the second piece is, as Jennifer was talking about, we see the assessment as this ongoing thing, uh, not just in the context of the organization or the community or the project that's using it, using it, changing, using it, but actually, a bigger sense, we can actually watch how a smaller project and a larger project might show up in the assessment. And that can give us data that we can feed back into the assessment. Right? So if we're seeing, here's a healthy small group and here are their conditions, here's a healthy large group and here are their conditions, we can then make the assessment um, aware of those and give you feedback based on what we're seeing actually working in the world. Because okay, uh, one of the questions, Dave, and, and this is really a question for Jacques, what, how big is big enough? Um, you know, Karuta is, is doing well, Jacques, in my, in my estimation. Um, and it's small, but is it, you know, you'd like it to be bigger, I understand that. But is it big enough? Is there, is there a point at which you say, ah, at that point, it's healthy, it's big enough? I don't, I don't feel like there's an answer to that question. I think it's going to be more challenging than that. Yeah. And also a bigger uh, open source community can, for example, form groups. There are ways to, to, to manage the, the size. Uh, 
Yeah. So uh, being a big one is, is not necessarily bad uh, if you sort of manage that and sort of, uh, but uh, yeah, that was just a question. Thank you. Uh, while you were talking, uh, thank you. That's a, it's an excellent question. It's an awesome question. And uh, Anne-Marie pointed out that roles people play matter. And that is something that's caught our attention too. Uh, how, do you, how do people engage in the community and what roles are they and how do you get into a role? How do you know what your role is and how do you know if you're performing in the role? And how do people in roles treat each other in other roles? Like, am I the developer? Am I the cool, the smartest student? Do I have a little bit of attitude? And over here, it's a, you know, a tester, user experience tester that maybe doesn't have coding skills, but is, you know, and are, are we, do we feel like equals? Like that, that feels like a, a factor that might figure in. So we've got some other questions here too. Um, how can a potential implementer, which is Ray in this case, leverage something like a HAQ to influence the decision makers or more generally assess the project? You know, can, could, could this be used, do you think, Dave, as an influencer? Could this be used as an influencer? Could you use the assessment to have a conversation with people and to lead them in a particular direction? Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, I think that, that maybe that's the idea. The idea is that this assessment isn't a standalone uh, machine that comes in and gives you a rate rating, but it's a converse, it's a, a support for a conversation that you have with people on your team about how your team is working and how you want it to grow or not and what you can do about it. The assessment's not trying to judge you, but trying to help you develop and continue and sustain. And so it's suggesting things you might think about. It's asking you questions that are designed to make you reflect. Does that answer that question? I don't know. Ray yeah. would have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm, I I'm thinking that's about a good I answer. get in situations yeah. where, oh, go ahead, Ray, you're about to talk. Oh, yeah, I think that was a pretty good answer. I, I like that. So Okay, good. <laughs> so, Jin, do you want to answer, speak to the assessment piece? Because that's Jin's expertise, actually. Got, turn your mic on. <laughs> Hi. So I'm writing questions down from the, the chat and the Zoom, and I was just kind of letting you take control. Yeah, okay, all right. So I, I didn't want to have spoken over you, but you've actually used assessments in, in program and assessing programs and community engagements and things like that. And so uh, maybe you can you speak to how they do they actually influence people to have conversations they wouldn't otherwise have? Absolutely. And then it's backed by the, the assessment. So my, my major experience with that is doing community needs assessments. So going into a community, assessing the needs of the community, developing an intervention that will assist that community based on the information received from the community. So it's a, um, it's a collaborative movement where you're the community saying, okay, these are the needs that we have. Okay, here's the intervention that we think will work in this community. And then evaluating that intervention and making the tweaks necessary where that might they might be needed. But it's absolutely a conversation piece. It's a back and forth conversation collaborative movement. Uh, just to speak to that, you could imagine if the assessment says um, something like, how do you feel your team is doing in, in terms of a sense of relatedness or camaraderie? How would you even know? So you'd have to talk about it. You have to get the team together and say, "How are we, let's be honest. How are we really doing? How do we, right? And so you would guess, you know, after you talk to each other, maybe you come up with a secret way to do it where people could say what they thought without each other knowing. I don't know, but you try to get the truth and you'd come up with an assessment that the group thought, okay, we're doing okay in that. We're doing eight out of 10, right? And then the assessment might say, right? So, so you, to, to even answer it, you'd have to have some kind of a, an unusual conversation that in itself would be a good thing for the community. Pretty much. So, Dave, here's a here, here's a question from uh, from Neil Caden, which is an interesting one. He uh, he notes that there's an assumption in the evaluation that it, this is a mature open source project, with respect to the project life life cycle. And I think I think that that's true. I mean, it's you know it's interesting to contemplate you know the applicability of this to both mature and less mature projects. Right. We, uh, we, if you saw on like the original slide of the original factors, one of the things we looked at was what's called life cycle literature. 
And this is a recognition, recognition, recognition excuse me, that every organization grows through this predictable sequence of modes as they go from immature to mature. And I think there's actually some stuff around this. That, uh, I think Aperio has some, some life cycle considerations for like, like, here's what we expect at different stages of, of a project that we take on, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that's definitely a thing. So I, I'm assuming that if our assessment's doing a good job, it's adjusting itself dynamically to where you are, right? So it's not expecting you, if you're right out of the gate, to meet the criteria of an established 10 year old successful commercially viable product or something like that. Uh, I'm not totally sure how it does that, but uh, that's what I'm hoping it can do. I think it has to be contextually um, aware in a couple of ways. Maturity of organization, size of organization, at least. And Neil Dr. also raises the questions about culture. What is he going to say? And Dr. Dr. Chuck did as well. He, he wrote about culture earlier in the thread, chat thread. And it's, it's a tough question. How do you measure culture? Yeah. Right. Well, it seems to me this is, this is more about measuring uh, inclusion, a culture of inclusion, than about culture more generally. Neil's post is Dr. Chuck's is more broad. Right. And I think they're connected, but they are, they're different to yeah. me. Right. I agree. Culture is pretty hungry, right? It eats everything. <laughs> That's a, not just the metrics, you get strategy, whatever. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, fortunately, that's the, the world of OD is all about that. So there's a whole lot of things that we can draw on to help people see or talk about or think about or measure their culture. Um, if, uh, the challenge is to do, how do you do that in a lightweight way so that you can, it's just a question on a, on a out of one out of 20 questions that you're answering. Um, how do we frame it in a way that you can understand it? But I think there's, there's a way to, to do that. Right, culture eat strategy for breakfast, right? And the reason is the culture are, is this, uh, these assumptions that we make kind of unconsciously about how things should be. And they overrule what, decisions that we make consciously about what we wanna do and so you can go in with all the intention you have and conscious intention, but if you're contradicting your subconscious uh, beliefs, they win, right? And that's where culture works. So to measure that, we have to make surface that somehow, make that visible to people, which is not normal. <laughs> people, don't, people don't usually just do, think about, reflect on uh, this, the, the things that are going on below the surface for them at work. Um, so that, that, that uh, it is something that we do in the OD field how, you know, the question of how to do it in a survey <laughs> context and assessment context is, is interesting. <clears throat> yeah, the way I look at culture is that you walk into a room and you look at the chairs in the room and you try to decide if the chairs are organized in a good way. But you never really ask whether there's oxygen in the room or not, right? You just assume right. there's oxygen. And so you don't measure the oxygen, but it turns yeah. out that, um, if you're on Mars, uh, the presence of oxygen is more important than the, the layout of the chairs in the room. It's a great metaphor. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, it's perfect, right? So our test needs to check on oxygen. And the challenge is you might not ever have thought of the word oxygen or known about it before. So our test has to give you a way to test for oxygen, even if you don't think about it. Uh, and it's easy and quick. Um, so that we can give advice to you about what to do in case you don't have any oxygen. Great metaphor. So I have a question. I'm not quite sure if it's a tangent or not, but I'll go ahead and ask. I remember we had a conversation at Sakai Camp about um, doing uh, potentially a, an ethnographic study of some of the listserv posts. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there had been any more discussion about doing that and if that might be a way to get a window into the culture. I'm so glad you brought that back. That was on our to-do list and I had not actually followed up in the pandemic. I lost in the pandemic, but yes, there is a realization that we have content. Uh, uh, we actually have the content of communications in the community uh, in the context of their work going back indefinitely. And we can do some kind of lightweight uh, content analysis of that. And in fact, we actually even realized that uh, the, um, I think the spouse of one of the long site 
uh, employees is has a, a content analysis background. So, so uh, yes, I think we could still do that. Josh, let's talk about that offline. <laughs> it's neat, right? So the idea is you'd look at, we can actually see people talking to each other in this chat and we can just look over the history of the chat or take sections of the chat and we can see how people are looking at each other and what words they're using and what, you know, and how does it feel in this thing? And is it, who, what roles are they playing? And, um, and, it, and it's kind of like an observation, a historical observation. Thank you for bringing that back up. Yes. Adrian's here. Yeah, I didn't want to say your uh, I didn't want to say your name without you knowing it. But since you said it, yes, your spouse, I'm trying to get her hired to to help us do some work here. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to her about it later. I'll put a word in her ear. Yeah. Right, yeah. 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 She's busy and cooking. I'm going to judge you because you'll be in those conversations, so that that might be a motivator. Yeah. Stop her cooking food. You know, she's cooking cooking too much food at the minute, you know, with the, with the lockdown, so get doing some research instead, have a good. Okay. Oh, I think we're almost out of time. Um, so uh, are any last questions before we wrap up? I was just gonna say, I probably could talk about, I'm, I'm guessing I would probably to talk about this topic for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's ad hoc rooms. You should sign up for an ad hoc room and, yeah. you know, get some people to meet you up in there and, mm. and, and have a, a more extended conversation. So, you know, we, we don't actually have a closed project. I think we're happy to involve just about anybody who wants to be involved and definitely can talk about it for a long time too. So, um, please. I mean, our aspiration would be to make the project kind of open source itself if we could figure out how to do that and eat our own dog food. Um, so please, more people involved is absolutely okay and fine and ideas and feedback are welcome. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. This is a fascinating topic um, and we really appreciate you presenting it today. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recorder now. Um, I think we have a lunch break, at least for the East Coast folks. Everybody else, you just get a, a regular break, I suppose. And um, there's a, at two o'clock, the Hacks Camp workshop begins. So um, if any of you guys are, are uh, planning to attend that, um, that starts at 2 p.m. Eastern. So um, thanks again, and we will see you back later this afternoon or tomorrow for more sessions. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Martin. Good job. <laughs>